Click the link in the description for your free Amsoil catalog. Before we get started, I'd like to give a quick shout out to some of our friends. The Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. Search for them on Facebook. Central Minnesota Pond Racing. Search for them on Facebook. The historic Lancaster Motel for the ultimate Eastern Trail Riding Adventure. Crane's Snowmobile Museum at 172 Main Street in Lancaster, New Hampshire. The Vintage Snowmobile Club of America Quarterly Magazine. The Bridge Street Garage Racing Team, the house racing team of the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. The New Hampshire Snowmobile Museum at Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. And lastly, if you decide to advertise with the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast, this could be your advertising message. Well, good evening and welcome to Season 3 of the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. Can you believe we're going into a, a third season with the podcast? I find that really exciting, and if you're here, I'm hoping that's the case for you as well. Hope you all had a great summer. We had a good summer on this end, and I'm really excited to start the new season. We've got a lot of really cool things planned for the upcoming season. I'm going to be doing this all the way through March. Um, if you're uh, Before we get started, we've got Rob waiting for us in the uh, green room. We're going to bring him on in just a moment, but before we get started, I want to make sure that everything is working properly. So if you can see my face and hear my voice, I'm going to ask you to make a comment. Um, let me know what you did over the summer. Also, uh, whether you can see me, see us and hear us okay. Uh, and also, whether you're a regular viewer or a first-time viewer. So let's take a look at some comments. We've got some coming in here. We've got, aha, our friend David at Alaska Railroad. He says, yes, the SLED podcast is back. He loves snow machines. And David, I'm hoping you caught the muscle car podcast last night. If you didn't, it's worth going back for a look because we had a, a Monte Carlo project car on there that I'm sure you're going to love. Uh, David also says he has plenty of cool photos to share. We are very much looking forward to that. Also, regular viewer Brian Van Haverbeek says, glad to see us back. Looking forward to another fun season. Uh, David from Alaska Railroad also says hi to Rob, who we're going to bring on here in just one moment. A couple more comments. We'll bring Rob on. I don't want to keep him waiting any longer. David Lowry says, really excited for the new season. Uh, welcome from Alberta, Canada. Cool deal. And one more comment here. We're going to bring Rob on. Uh, Stacy and Art Fosler, regular viewers of both the Vintage Snowmobile podcast and the Muscle Park podcast, which we very much appreciate. They say everything sounds good, and they're in Platte, Platte Kill, New York, regular viewers. 
All right, let's bring our friend Rob on here. Uh, Rob, how you doing Hello. tonight? <laughs> Hello, Mike. How was your summer? Oh, it was great. Great. How about you? Busy, busy. You know, I got so busy this summer. I haven't even put the snowblower away from last year. It's still something inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. Cool deal. Cool. So you're you're. We were talking before we went on. It sounds like you're just about to to make the transition of putting the boat away and getting the snowmobiles ready. Yeah, this is our Canadian Thanksgiving, so we got one more trip on the boat around the lake and park it, and then get the docks out of the way and get the snowmobiles ready before the snow starts falling. So, winter's going to come soon. Yeah. Now, some of my friends were out hunting and they seen snow already this year. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. No kidding. Yeah, we've been getting some frost here the last week or so, and it's 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 only going to get uh, we're only going to see more of that for sure. Uh, let's see. We've got another comment that's come in. We've got John Wernsdorfer from East Eastern Shore, Virginia. Regular viewer and a cat guy, a fellow cat guy. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you, John, for being on. We appreciate it. So let's take a look at what we're doing tonight. Item number one is a video that I did uh, with a friend of mine last fall. This is a good friend of mine, lives nearby, and he's got an incredible Rupp collection. Um, this is a two-part video. We're going to watch part one right now and the second part at the end of the podcast. Let me get that queued up. Um, there's no need to really say much about it because his sleds are going to speak for themselves. Uh, let's get this going here. So what we have here is a 78 last year that Rupp was in business, I guess, before they defunct. But this is a 78 440 Nitro. It's the exact same sled as a 77. The, the only difference was is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the seat cover was changed a little bit. Uh, the uh, the dash is basically changed. They moved the gauges a little bit. They moved the key in the chokes. Not nearly as friendly. And th this has got and the hood was different. As you can see, this is different than the '77 over there. You notice this grill thing. Basically, all they did was cut that out and put that in versus that over there. Now this led them or not? Those were not. The, that's kind of a custom decal job that I had on there. Um, this sled has, uh, it's the same engine, same running gear. Uh, from what I understand, these are just the parts that were left uh, to uh, be sold, left over. They just changed those few items. At this point now, from what I understand, Iron Cat was now assembling the soon to be doomed company. So Iron Cat assembled these sleds. And uh, yeah, my friend uh, Dave Hunt, Made these decals, put them on there. I handed in the hood, and I just told him go ahead and uh, just make it look kind of cool. I gave him an idea. It's sort of what I wanted done. Yeah, it looks good. And uh, it's not all correct, but then again, the sled is not totally correct either. Um, it uh, this one here was another pretty good project. Totally uh, had to rebuild the motor. Uh, the skid, I put new high facts in it, new shock. Um, you can see that I had the exhaust powder coated. Uh, had to rebuild the engine, two pistons, seems to be a common thing. Had the cylinders bored. Um, it does have new, these are new old stock panels. When we say panels, we're talking about the sides and the belly pan and the other side, of course. On, <clears throat> on these sleds, on the nitros, it's kind of a cool feature. The Rupp decided that this would be uh, to help cool the engine. You notice there's water that goes through that. So in the wintertime, when you're out your hands get cold, you can literally get out and put your hands on the on the bottom. Oh, these are warm. Wow. And it, 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 is, it does help. There, there's no denying. It is a significant help for the cooling. And on the front, these ridges collect air to yeah. help keep it cool. Granted, when you're traveling, if you're following somebody, uh, they're always spitting snow up. Yeah. So... Uh, that that is uh, that is that is a very kind of a cool thing about them. I, I'm surprised how strong those bumpers are because that one. This is actually a new bumper. This is a new old stock bumper that I got for it. And uh, but they're strong as hell because when you put them on, you're trying to bend them a little bit to get them to fit. You know, yeah. these are all fiberglass, and, and it's like uh, you can wrestle like hell to get them to move. And if you get it stuck, it's strong oh, yeah, enough you can lift on it? Sure, yeah. It's, it's mounted right to the bulkhead. There's some supports on the inside that hold it up. I mean, I 
I don't want to climb a tree with the thing. Sure. And it would give you some protection in a collision too? Absolutely. Okay, good. Unlike, unlike that one or my Magnum over there. Sure, yeah. They, they Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, just fiberglass, yeah. I do think if I want to make a trail slide of that, how the hell are you going to, if you run into a snow bay, how are you going to get out of there with that thing? You know, yeah, good point. Skis, that's about it. Yes. But uh, these slides were roughly uh, 80 horsepower. And uh, I have no reason to go any faster, but I've had this thing going 80 miles an hour. That's and plenty they, fast, yeah. They are the, they were like the first company to have the motor set forward versus back here. You know, in previous years, you know, see what I'm talking about? Yes. The motor set forward versus sure. sitting in front of your face. Yeah. And it gives it a, a, a much ba better balance and handling. And these things go great. I mean, uh, like I said, my wife enjoys running these things way more than the than the uh, than my new my new Polaris. Nice. Yeah. So the difference between uh, this is this like I said, this would have been the seventy eight. That one's a seventy seven. That one on the end is a seventy six. Uh, the motor was different in the seventy six. Uh, horsepower rating was a little less. Um, different block. If you will, I mean, the case is different. The cylinders are different. There's not very many interchangeable parts for that engine to these, is what I'm trying to say. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the style of the sled is the same, the same width, same weight, and all that. I mean, I, I, I've ridden them, all three of them, obviously, and that one goes equally as well. I'm just, uh, those are the differences. Sure. Cool, Leo. Yeah. What uh, would you think of that, Rob? Oh, he knows his reps, doesn't he? Oh, for I don't sure. think I've ever seen one with the rat on the front like that. Yeah. That's a great idea. That is. Yeah. And I don't know of any other brands that did, any, that did anything like that. No. I've never seen anything like that. You're right. It's truly unique. And from what he says, it, it, it worked very well. Yeah. And Because one of the concerns I had, too, is if you do get that stuck and you start yanking on that, is it going to hold up? And he said it was very, very rigid and it, it wouldn't be an issue, he didn't think. Oh, most rads are quite strong. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. And we, now, have an ash, we have an asphalt drag machine that we have a heat problem with because we don't have no rads in it, in it. So what, all we have is just a reservoir. That's it. Something like that would give us a little bit extra cooling for... We yeah, can make it sure. back, back to the pits without towing it. Yeah, maybe do some kind of custom fabricated radiator across the front there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, if you were enjoying that and felt that we cut it short, that's exactly what we did. I like to keep the videos under five minutes, but we've got part two at the end of this podcast where we're going to continue the conversation with him. Also, I've, I've, uh, I'm working with him. We, he and I have been messaging. I'm going to be going up there here sometime in the next week or so because I saw that he had a sled at the Pittsburgh show. Uh, and let me, let me show you the sled. What do you think of that? <laughs> So uh, I want to I want to go up there and uh, do some more video on that sled and some of the other sleds that we didn't get to uh, on that other visit uh, that, that we were just looking at. So very much looking forward to that. Um, so where are we now? We're on item number two. Uh, time for some announcements. Um, we're going to give a, uh, Rob a chance here to talk about Amsoil. I just have to get find my place here. I'm using a different interface than I use with the Muscle Car Podcast. So everything's foreign to me but uh yeah if you wanted to to go into the uh into this for us rob okay mike and i are both amsoil dealers and if anybody's interested in becoming a first customer with amsoil you can sign up under mike his email is on here his phone number is on here and by becoming a first dealer you get the best possible price to buy the product you save over 25 percent anybody who orders over a hundred dollars worth get it shipped to them free um uh, you get 25% off on your birthday. They give you a $5 coupon. If you buy so much, they give you another $5 coupon to help pay for your membership when you time to renew. But right now, until October the 11th, they're offering anybody who orders $75 or more, they're going to give you uh, three of the shop rags, just like these ones. <laughs> well, let me change screens. There yeah. we go. I'm going to put yeah. you full screen so we can get a real good look at that. Yeah, Amsoil shop, shop rags. There we go. Sweet. Yep. So if you order $75 worth, they send you three of these free with your order. So you also save 25% on the product. You're getting a great deal on the product, and you're getting some free products from Amazon for purchasing them. 
And if you want a catalog, at the end of the email, Mike's got a thing you click on and you can get a free catalog, tell you about all the products we do have available. Absolutely. Yeah, like you said, just look in the description. There's links for free catalogs and to, to sign up for the preferred customer program and to order whatever you need to do. There are links for it there in the description. And, and we thank you in advance for your support because, as he mentioned, I'm signed up under Rob. So if you order through me, Rob and I both benefit and the commissions I make go directly toward offsetting the cost of doing this podcast. Uh, so I thank you in advance for that. If, if you buy Amazon through us, you're doing an enormous amount to to help with this podcast to keep it going because there are expenses related to this, which I'm happy to pay. I love doing this, but it, it, it's not cheap. But we've got some more comments that have come in, and we're going to continue here with some more uh, uh, um, announcements. Let's see. We've got Mark Gosso. Looking forward to another fun season. And thank you so much, Mark. We had a lot of fun last season with you. Uh, you came on one time and also – uh, we were able to, uh, he had some old snowmobile magazines from the seventies that he was willing to sell to me. So we agreed on a price and he sent me about 70 magazines and I'm going to be taking some shots from that and popping those on the screen here throughout the season. Looking forward to that as well. Uh, David from Alaska railroad says, loves that Magnum. Uh, one of those, this is one of his need to have sleds for sure. Stacy and Art Fosler says, uh, he had a 72 nitro 400 and he wishes he never got rid of it. I know that feeling. Cool deal. Cool deal. So over the summer, I got a lot of emails, um, people asking questions about, you know, technical questions and availability questions, things like this. So I'm going to pop them on the screen to see if anyone has answers for these people. And I've messaged them to let them know I'm going to be doing this tonight. So um, for the people who have, who have asked the questions, make a comp post a comment in here so people can see you. Um, and that, that's a good way for the for you to, to get a conversation started if someone has an answer for you. So Greg Jansack says, do you have any pictures of a David Bradley snowmobile? It was a real beast. And I apologize. I've never heard of David Bradley, uh, but I'm very intrigued. If anyone knows anything about David Bradley, any kind of a backstory about what makes him unique or notable, uh, please leave some comments here. And especially if you have some images, uh, please share it with us here at the podcast. Um, I'm going to pop my email address on the screen um yeah right here okay in fact i'm going to keep that up while we're doing the the rest of these uh these questions so yeah if you have an answer to that make a comment here in the comment section and greg uh, will see that also jamie pasco says hello looking for a good running sax km 914a or km 19 914b motor a complete motor um, so if you know anything about a motor like that, uh, leave a comment here in the sec in the comment section. I'm going to ask Jamie to also leave a comment as well as Greg uh, so that people can find you if they, they have uh, uh, answers for you and want to get in touch with you. Uh, Sean Farr says he's looking for a 1970 MK2 Ski Boost windshield. Any idea where to look? Uh, so if anybody has information on a windshield for a Ski Boost 1970, uh, please make a comment here in the comment section. Stephen Bodie says, any old pictures of a, a speed sled called Bunky's Toy? It's powered by two PSI 474cc triples around a 1988 era. Uh, also, the sled and race owner, he believes, were from Minnesota. I'm curious about this, too. Powered by two engines, two triples. That sounds like quite a beast. I'd, I'd like to see that. So if anybody knows anything about that, either send me an email or leave a comment here in the description. And we'll get a comment started, a conversation started about that. Lastly, or next to last, I, I apologize. Stephen Piffer says, can you please help me out with engine parts to rebuild a Kohler K295? Is the model number and the spec number are on the uh, screen there. Uh, or tell me who can, who would know about this. So if anybody knows where he might find an engine like that, please leave a, a comment in the comment section. And also to the, all of the people who have posed these questions, please uh, make a comment in the comment section so people can see you to, to reach out to you about this. So the last one we've got is we've got a really cool image from Kevin Lowther. Now, this is a, a vintage snowmobile image from, uh, I think, the late 60s to early 70s. He's, he's got some information here. I'm going to pop the screen with the information. I'm going to read it, and then we'll pop the image again so we can put it all into proper context. So this image was taken in a small mountainous town of Halvetia, West Virginia, uh, guessing about the mid-60s to early 70s. In the town, there's a small grass landing strip, and the planes are all small cubs or pipers, uh, and they belong to three friends that spend a lot of time together. Uh, they are all, all of these planes are equipped with skis, 
Not quite sure, but he thinks someone in the party had a hunting camp there at one time, uh, and the the vintage sleds were kept at at the. Oh, that's where the vintage sleds were kept at that time. Uh, a celebration to cast out winter is a traditional festival that's held there every year, and that brings in several people in the small village for that weekend for food, dancing, outdoor events in the Swiss German tradition. Quite a time to his understanding. Spring is welcome there because the winters can be quite brutal. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much to Kevin. Let's take another look at that image now that we've talked about it. So we can kind of put that in its proper context. And uh, yeah, thank you so much to Kevin for sharing that with us. We really appreciate it. All right. So we are on item number three. Also over the summer, our regular viewer, uh, Spencer Delubrier, sent us some images from the Articat 60th anniversary event that happened over the summer. Uh, let me cue that up, and we're going to take a look at that event. Yes, sorry. Thank you. I shut my mic off during the during the uh, during that montage. But yeah, thank you so much to Spencer Delubrier for those images. I put that into a little montage there that we can all enjoy. Uh, thoughts on that, Rob? Oh, okay. Um, can anyone else hear me? Can you hear me now, Mike? Yes, much better. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, sorry about this. Gotcha. Sorry about the confusion on that. I think my headphones went dead. Gotcha. Gotcha. No problem at all. Anything jump out at you in that montage? Or oh, from I that love already, already kind of it. Yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't have the, any of their EXTs, the Snowcross racers, and all that they had. Yeah, because already got well, Tucker's machine. Everybody like that were big at Snowcross. Yes. Good point. Good point. They probably yeah, were been, there. It's very likely, yeah, because I understand that was a big event, and if if anyone else was there that had that it was e either able to take images or video, we would love it if you could share that with us for all of us to enjoy here on the podcast. And one, of the, I enjoyed everything that was on there, but one of the things that I I noticed uh, was that that tractor trailer. I I don't know if I saw that in a magazine or on YouTube, I'm not or Facebook or something, but apparently that's a, a semi truck from the uh, late. 70s or early 80s and they used to deliver articats uh to i imagine dealerships or go to shows with it uh, and someone restored that um and i'm fuzzy on the details so don't quote me on any of that if anyone knows more about that than i do i would love to hear about that there might be a story there i'd love to find who, that out who does own the boss cut now no idea if anybody knows anything about that too we would love to hear about that um, especially if you know the person and maybe you could put them in touch and we could do some video with them or uh, have, get, I'd love to get that on the podcast at some point to, to find out firsthand from the current owner what the story is on that. Yeah. 
for sure. Have you ever seen that in person at shows or anything? Or I think I was at an event that it was supposed to show up and run at, and we got there late, so we missed it. Gotcha. But there was yeah. about seven other machines similar to that that was going to be there running. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Now, we've got a comment that's come in. David from Alaska Railroad said he sent me an email on a David Bradley said. Uh, outstanding. So I will keep that and forward that to the person who was asking. And I apologize. I, I don't remember the name of the person that was asking me. If, if it's not in front of me, uh, it, you know, having a senior moment. <laughs> but uh, uh, what else were we going to do here? Oh, we, I think I saw another comment come in. Here we go. Okay. John Wernsdorfer says there's a guy in Richmond, Virginia, that has a massive Articat collection. Uh, check out on Marketplace. The gentleman's name is Sean Mongor. Uh, yeah, thank you for the tip on that. We will look for that for sure. In fact, um, I may search for that during this next video and see if we can pull it up. We'll we'll see um, what kind of luck I have with that. But thank you for the tip on that. So what do we have next here? We're on item number four. Um, if you were with us last week, uh, I, I did a, a, a live podcast with Charlie Vallier over at the top of the Lake Snowmobile Museum in Knobbin Way, Michigan. And we got about 20 minutes into it and we lost the internet connection. So we had to cut it short, which was very disappointing. Uh, but we got a good 20 minutes of it. And then uh, we also did another podcast with him this morning. So what I'm going to do is all through the season is take excerpts from the videos that we did with him uh, and put them here on the podcast. And that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, let me cue that up. And we're going to take a look at the uh, some footage from the top of the lake uh, Snowmobile Museum, Knobbin Way, Michigan. Cool. So we are live right now. And uh, yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. We're here with Charlie Vallier, and he is over in Knobbin Way, Michigan, at the top of the lake Snowmobile Museum. How are you doing, Charlie? Oh, we're doing bright and early. Had a little frost this morning, 28 degrees. We're ready for snowmobile season. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it won't be long. Won't be long at all. No. Well, cool. So, Charlie, tell us about this museum. Are you the founder of the museum, or is this your museum? I'm, I'm one of the founders. Um, we started in 07 uh, with the help from the community and other snowmobile enthusiasts, but we are the ones that uh, run it and keep it going and do all that. It's our hobby. Wonderful. Very cool. So, since 2007, you've been doing this? Yes. Well, Great. I've been doing it quite a lot longer than that. Um, I started doing snowmobiles when I got out of the Army in 1971. I talked my dad into being a Viking dealer. Uh, so he became a Viking dealer. So the eight of us kids could get Vikings at cost. Um, and it's been a passion ever since. Wow. So you've never stopped? Never stopped. No. That's amazing. That's wonderful. So you've, you've accumulated a significant collection of your own, I'm sure. Yes. I, I've got a bunch of my collection here at the museum, but I still have another 150 sleds at home. Can't have all of mine in here. Sure. Uh, so yeah, we have a, a, a great mixture of sleds. We have 185 sleds in the museum. We're about the history of snow sleds, snow sledding. Um, so that's why we can't have all the mine. We have to have a, a mixture of sleds because yes. we're about. Sure, sure. So let's do this, Charlie. If you feel like t turning your camera around, uh, that way we can get a better look of what, what's going on there in the museum and you can give us a walking tour and then talk up what we're looking at. And uh, to the viewers who are watching this, if you have comments or questions for Charlie, uh, just leave a comment in the uh, comment section and I'll read that to Charlie and hopefully we'll get an answer for you. Sure. All right. My technology pulled through. <laughs> yes. All right. I got a show you something up here on a wall what we start with um, okay. walking back into the gift shop we'll talk about that later but up yeah. on the wall here we have where the history of snowmobiling comes to life yeah and that's what we're all about is the history of snowmobiling and we start with this first thing right here it looks like a toboggan as you can see and it's called the elias and power toboggan yeah made in center wisconsin he's been blessed with the first manufactured snow sled you can see it's got an indian motorcycle engine on it um he built his first one in 1924 in Sainter, Wisconsin, and then the military wanted to buy 200 in 1939. He couldn't produce the 200, so he contracted with the four-wheel drive company out of Clintonville, Wisconsin, to build the first 200 for the military. So he's been blessed with the first manufactured snow sled. Yeah. There's stuff being made then, one-of-a-kind stuff, but mm -hmm. this is where it started. That's amazing. Yes. Very cool. And then, That's of course, we've got all colors and kinds, and uh, we tell people when they come into the museum that this section right here I'm looking at now uh, there's a Polaris and there's a Polar and a Fox track and yeah. Uh, um, right here in this community, Nobbin Way, we're called the Top of the Lake Snowmobile Museum because we're at the top of Lake Michigan. Hmm. So that's why we're called Top Lake. So Lake Michigan, commercial fishing. Uh, Nobbin Way is a commercial fishing village, still is today. 
So uh, back in the early days, you go two miles out in Lake Michigan, get 500 pounds of whitefish um, or whatever kind of fish, but whitefish are what's here mostly. Um, away, get them off the ice after the dog sleds and the horses. When these rear engine machines came along, uh, they used these machines right here in this town. Well, wow. uh, another big use was trappers. Um, the guy with the Elias, and you can see here, he's got snowshoes on there. Hmm. Uh, he wanted to get further into the woods trapping. Uh, so that's what he used it for. So trapping, commercial fishing, uh, utility companies was another big use of them. Uh, farmers, loggers, uh, quite a variety of uses. Yeah. Of course, what we have today, race. Yes. It seems that like I always thought, you know, as soon as the second snowmobile was made, that's when racing began. Right. And the <laughs> We have, it's in the back of the building here. We'll get to that. But remember, I, here's one right here. This is a homemade, it was made uh, 40 miles from here. It's called an Anderson. Anderson family made five of these. Uh, my yeah. dad, this for $5. Five dollars. Had no idea what it was. Dad got it running. It's, it's, so then we found out what it was and we found out they made five of them. But this has got a, you can see the beaver in it because they use them for beaver trapping. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's just a, here's one with a, an ice auger. It's a trail maker, 1964 trail maker made in Hibbing, Minnesota. This machine came with, uh, well, you can see the wheel go around the front too, but you can see the wheel kit was an option. The snow plow was an option. And this is ice auger here. That was another option for them. I'll go to the front so you can see it from the front. Hope I'm not moving too fast, making somebody dizzy. Sure. No, that's fine. Sure. But you're right. In the early days, it was more about utility than recreation, wasn't it? It, it was. That's what it started for. It was work, utility. That's what it started for. Um, so there's the trail maker with the wheel kit, snow plow, and then the ice auger back there. They Those were all options for them. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But that's what they were used for is to work. Here's a Bearcat made in Antigo, Wisconsin. Like 12 or 14 of those were made. Yeah. Here's a, a snow bug. It was made in Sudbury, Ontario. This version is called a love bug but because um, you set side by side in it. Sure. They made different versions. Um, you know, back on the wheel kit stuff here, this is a Scatmobile made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yeah. This wheel kit or the skis. So this was kind of your forerunner to the four-wheelers that we have today. Sure. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to Charlie for, for that tour. Uh, and we went on for, we've got probably an hour and a half worth of uh, material from that tour. We'll be showing you that throughout the season. And if somebody wants to take a look at the those videos in their entirety, just scroll through the videos on on this channel and you can check it out. But any thoughts? Uh, anything jump out at you there, Rob? Did I hear him correctly? He said he has 150 more at home himself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the really antique stuff too. You know, oh, rear everything engine. I've seen that was really old so far. Yeah, he loves that rear engine stuff, and yeah, yeah. I was fortunate enough to run into him at Old Forge, New York, this summer at the VSCA national event. Uh, and we got to talking and I, and of course, you know, that he's involved with that museum. I had to ask him, you know, what do you think about doing some video, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it just worked out really nice because I've always been curious about that museum as I'm sure probably you have, uh, and to actually get a, a, you know, narrated tour. I've drove past the sign about 12 times now. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. I guess I'm going to have to stop in there next time going by. I didn't think it'd be that big. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's impressive. It's bigger than I thought it would be. For sure. And we've got some comments coming in. Let's see. We've got uh, Dave Shiska says, hello from Brandon, Manitoba, Canada. How are you doing tonight? And it looks like he's got a little shot glass there and a thumbs up. So, yeah, cheers. Cool deal. And then uh, David from Alaska Railroad says, boy, how the sleds have evolved. You're not kidding there. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. They were more for utility back then. And you saw like the auger kits and things like that, you know, and now it's all recreation. You know, you wouldn't see that on a sled like that today. Uh, and then D Stacey and Art Fosler said the sled with the plow on it, uh, wondering if it had reverse. I hope it did. Good question. <laughs> Excellent question. Next time I talk to Charlie, I'll ask him that. Cool deal. Cool deal. Uh, let's see. What do we have next here? We're on item number five. Now, we've got a regular viewer, Dirk Seams, who sends us footage quite often, and we very much appreciate that. Uh, he sent us some footage a little while back from a, a vintage snowmobile show in Elk River, Minnesota. Uh, let me switch screens here. We're going to take a look at that. Yes, right here. Well, we ran into a little bottleneck getting off the racetrack here under the trail. So we uh, swung up high on the outside track here. And uh, 
got a thinner group coming behind us because they got lots of room. And then we kind of end up in a bottleneck uh, here by getting off the track. Kind of slow going for some of these higher performance levels. Top on the ears. The old scorpion bullhead. We got a must have been cruising through the woods, picked up a frog in front of that one. Well, we just got out of the lunch line here. And uh, <coughs> good pork chops. They've been cooking them since early this morning. So they can cycle the people through pretty quick and uh, so it's kind of a stopping spot after the trail ride and uh, got the uh, nice heated pavilion here and they got, uh, I guess I was in there earlier today with all the John Deere sleds and got the heated bathrooms over there, pretty nice, uh, temperature could be a little warmer but it's just not too bad here, got a few more uh, Tray is coming through here. We got a, a couple old seahorses or ski horses, I guess they call them. Yeah, there you go. So, anyway, this is uh, the Elk River. And like I say, we just stopped for lunch. We're going to go hit the swap meet again here after our lunch and bathroom break. So, that's the update for midday today. Cool deal. Yeah, so thank you so much to Dirk Seams for that footage. Anything jump out at you in there, Rob? I thought a seahorse was an outboard motor. I didn't know they made snowmills. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It might be ski horse. Maybe no, that's that what he meant. a huge turnout. Oh. Yeah. Big event. That's bigger than anything we have. Because most of these the shows I go to are Vermont, northern Vermont and New Hampshire. And we have some nice shows by that standard, but nothing like this. No, no. If we have 50 antiques show up, that's a lot. And sure. there's got to be at least 10 people to total, total 10 of them back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, it looked like a nice event. Um, let's see. So we're on item number six. Now, I've got to tell you some backstory on this. Um, we're going to look at the, the, the history of when, how ski Doo came to America uh, back in 1958. Um, they were the, Most of the story will be told on the video, but... It all started in 1958. The first ski do snowmobiles came to the U.S. through Lancaster, New Hampshire, and that more or less started snowmobiling in the U.S. So we're going to hear the story about that. Uh, this locate the first location we're going to be at is behind the Lancaster Motel, literally a stone's throw from the back parking lot, and that's the first building where they they set up shop for the um, for for ski do in in the U.S. Now after a few years, they outgrew that. They went to a second location. Where they could have a larger warehouse uh and and midge and i went over there to get some video and we're starting to do some video and someone came over in a security vehicle very quickly want to know what we were doing and told us we, we can't be doing video there so we reached a compromise with the security guy we said well what if we take two images one from one from uh images from different angles of the building and then midge and i will just go away and and, and do the narration of it uh you know off site and he said, that'd be fine. So we took two pictures and we went on our way. And then the third item I'll leave as, as a surprise. Uh, it's better to, to watch it than to hear me talking about it. Let me uh, pull this up here. We're going to hear about the first ski do snowmobiles coming to, the, to, coming to America. Folks, this is the original site of the old Sherman Motors building that was purchased by Timberland Machines back in 1958. Uh, they sold Bombardier products uh, from Ontario, Canada. And they needed a branch store in New England. So Bob Bottoms, the manager of the, of the uh, store in America, he came to New England and he looked all over. He looked in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. He uh, did an extensive search. And he just happened to look at Lancaster as being the center hub of logging back in the 1960s and uh, early, late 50s. And he settled on Lancaster as the branch store. And behind me is where the old Sherman Motors building was. It was a Dodge dealership. They went out, he purchased the building, and this is where the original Bombardier Skidoo came to America in 1959, right here. December 4th, 1959, the first Bombardier Skidoo came to America. 
and poured it right into this, the building that stood on this spot. The building spot. is not the original building. The original building was torn down. This building was further down. They moved it up here. This building belonged to the old Thompson Manufacturing uh, Company. And they moved it up here for a welcome center. But the original uh, building, the Dodge dealership, that building was torn down. But it was in about this area. This you said it was at a different angle, huh? It was a different angle. It was more like here, and I think it was more this way. Because uh, there were some sheds to my left. There was a series of sheds where they kept the school buses back then. And so this, uh, this whole area here was all uh, Sherman Motors Company uh, area. That building that, that uh, Mike just took a photo of uh, was the original site of the Timberland Machines building uh, that they constructed in 1966. Uh, the reason they did that was uh, basically because of the Bombardier Skidoo. Uh, sales took off big time in 1965, 66, and uh, when the building was finally finished in 1967, uh, they, was, they were selling between eight and 10,000 snowmobiles out of there every year. So they needed a big warehouse to house this, uh, this new phenomenon that was coming on the scene. And so uh, if it, later, I think it was like in 70, 71, I think uh, they were selling 10,000 or better snowmobiles out of there every year until, uh, until the peak, until you know, everything crashed and, and a lot of companies went out of business. But in the early 70s, it was still kicking. And if you would uh, consider this, uh, they, Timberland Machines had a big racing program, uh, and Bob Fortin was the captain, Bob Martin was a, was a team member, uh, Timmy White, uh, Frank Dodge, and uh, so on. They had a, a pretty good uh, race team there. They even built a little race shack out back specifically to work on the sleds. And uh, the story was that Bob Bottoms would take $100 uh, off, from the, off from the each crate that they were putting out of there, he would take $100 from each sale of, of the sled and putting it towards the race program. So you're, you're looking at the $100,000 yeah, race program. Yeah, that adds up fast. And uh, $100,000 $100, back in 1970 and 71 was a huge amount of money. So you can see why Timberland Machines did so well on the racetrack was because they had a lot of, uh, a lot of funding behind them. And, uh, and Bob Fortin uh, was getting paid a salary, uh, plus he could make anything that he made on the racetrack he could keep so he was taking home thousand fifteen hundred sometimes two thousand uh, dollars on a weekend uh, from his winnings and he didn't have to pay for any of the parts because Timberland Machines uh, racing program furnished him he could go to the stock room and grab a cylinder and a piston and whatever thing you know whatever he needed to win races with so uh, it, uh, it was an unbelievable program and uh, it put Lancaster on the map big time because everywhere Timberland Machines raced you know, they had Lancaster, New Hampshire, it was Timberland Machines on the side of their race van and uh, the 45 foot box. And uh, that was an incredible time period, really, back then. Yeah. Uh, to have uh, our town be so well represented by a uh, snowmobile race team. Yeah, for sure. You know. And, Is there a picture of that truck and trailer anywhere, do you know? Uh, I think, I think there is. Uh, and I think it's on the Stockwell Road right over here. So if you want to drive up there, maybe we can. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I can't tell. There's not enough uh, scratched away to be able to tell. Are there graphics on the other side too? Yeah, faded. Worse. Way worse? Back. Okay, this is the good side? Yeah, this is the better side. Is that side the sun hits it? Oh, sure, yeah. Oh yeah, and then you get the post and the, yeah. Is there anything on the back side, any graphics? Yeah, there is. It's pretty big. Yeah. Now well, there used to be a railing on top. Oh, an observation? Bob Bottoms and some of the dignitaries from Timberland used to get up on top to, to watch the races. That's wild. So uh, this may not be that trailer, but you can get a shot of, uh, of how the graphics were on the side of that race trailer, other, other than it being white and not yellow. Yeah. That's pretty much how it looked. That is wild. So yeah, ski do in America. That's, uh, that's how it all started right there. What's the chance of finding that trailer still sitting around there? Yeah, that's unbelievable.
Yeah, and apparently he knows the people whose property that is, so they were okay with us walking around there and getting video and everything. God. So it worked out nice, yeah. But uh, I can just picture, I don't know if that was the exact trailer, but he was talking about how they had an observation deck, deck for the dignitaries on top of one of those trailers. And you can picture a lot of people up there watching the races and everything. Seems like that'd be a good vantage point. Yes. Very cool. Now, let's see. We've got a comment coming in. Oh, here we go. Kevin Lowther says, thank you for the feature on tonight's podcast. Enjoyed riding in the day. We had quite an active club. Uh, one time, sadly, a lot of members have passed on. Oh, at one time. Uh, sadly, a lot of members have passed on. A lot of great times and memories, though. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for that image. Uh, and in case you're wondering what we're talking about, uh, that was uh, Kevin is the one who shared this image right here. Uh, so we thank him for that and for the story behind it. And, uh, yeah, those sure were the days. Um, yeah, you, you must have good memories as well of, of the 70s and everything around snowmobiling back then, Rob. Well, I had a skidoo like that, but I had the seat lifted up and I had a toolbox built underneath to carry enough tools to make sure I made it home. Yes. <laughs> and I absolutely. always had an extra belt sit, sitting on the handlebars. Yes, belts and spark plugs. and Yeah. Absolutely. And roll of duct tape. Yeah. And when I, when I was 19 years old, 20 of us, we had our own snowmobile club. Yeah. Yeah, nice. we, we rented an old farmhouse beside a racetrack, and they let us use it all the way along for us to go snowmobiling out of. We're 20 years old. Sweet, yeah. So it's like, like your base camp almost. Yep. You work on the sleds in there and then go on, go on rides and, and come back. Every, and week, every week, and we all showed up there and took off on rides. And yeah. Worked all week long trying to fix them again. That's cool. Those were the days. Yeah, yeah it's true. You work on them for two hours to ride them one hour in a lot of cases. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everybody brought a rope, and everybody had to come along with them, and somebody always had snowshoes with them. Yes, yes. In fact, I remember finding out the hard way what happens uh, if you run, if you're going to tow a machine, if you run a rope between both skis, and of course it pulls them together like. Oh, let me get my hands and pulls the skis together like this, <laughs> yeah. and often can break a spindle. You know, <laughs> but I uh, only did that once. Yeah, after that, we lesson. Yes, after that we'd try to jam a big stick into the loops of each of the skis. So we've got a kind of a cross member there and we tie onto that. And as long as that stick wouldn't break, we'd be, we'd be all set. Oh, we had a friend who had a device where he would take the skis off and turn them backwards and oh, yeah. put the back of the snowmobile on his hitch on a snowmobile. Yeah. So we, so we would tow the snowmobile backwards back home. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, low we, had friction. To tow a lot of, we had to tow a lot of people home. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we did too. And I remember, um, a lot of times when we'd tow, we'd have um, those those sleds. It was like they would call it, I think, a magic carpet sled. It was just a big piece of plastic that would roll up, and we'd yep. keep that and we'd put that underneath the, the track so you wouldn't have that resistance, you know. Yep. And of course, yep. that would always slide out from under there, and it was kind of a fiasco to do that. But I still yeah. have a device called a banana. And yeah, it has a hitch on it. So every once in a while, I'd go get it, take it out in the lake, and put the snowmobile right on right on the banana to tow yep. tow it back for the people. There you go. Yeah. Because yeah, the newer ones now are so hard to tell. They're so heavy. Oh, I bet. Yeah. A lot of weight and probably the resistance of because of the track, it won't turn. That's a lot of resistance. Yeah. Back in the old days, that's how we get the name Fox Walk Back for the Fox Track. <laughs> yeah. Because every time you went out on it, you had to walk back. Walk back. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, let's see. We've got some more comments coming in. We've got uh, David from Alaska Railroad says his 70 Articat had a 399 JLO in it. He worked on it four hours to ride 10 minutes. There you go. Yeah. And that ended when he put a 530 Polaris on it. There you go. And then Kevin Lowther says, make sure the drive belt is removed before towing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. I met some, I met some oh, city people one time. I met some city people one time. They were towing the machine down the road trying to boost it. Really? They thought if they could tow it fast enough, they could jump it, start it. the clutch would engage and it would start turning over. Uh. But the thing is, they were out of gas anyway, so no matter what they did, it wasn't going to work. Yeah, it wasn't going to happen. No. <laughs> You're right, a lot wrong with that picture. Well, cool. So we're on item number seven. Boy, this, this episode went by fast, but I've got uh, an idea on what we can do for the last few minutes. Uh, but we've got item number seven. We're going to watch part two of those, those Ray Parento sleds, those reps we were looking at earlier. We're going to watch the continuation of that conversation. Let me cue that up. Oh, yeah, I've got a couple other things, too. All right, let's take a look. This one here is my first project. When I got this thing, it was it was literally a basket case. And uh, 
I had to totally disassemble this one, and uh, I, I'm proud to say that this was my first project in this vintage sled thing, and uh, it, it came out pretty good. It, I mean, it, I'm sure a perfectionist could pick it apart, but it, it goes great. Yeah, it looks great. It goes great. And uh, this got the whole ball starting started for you as far as this vintage project, the yeah, vintage hobby. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we live here in northern Vermont, and... Uh, I got out of snowmobiling. I, I never really, when I was a kid, these kind of sleds, we, we could never have at our house. The, these are hot rods. I mean, we, we rode old bottom deers and motor skis and, and uh, something like this weren't going to happen at my house. So I came across the ad for this particular sled and it was, I said, well, that's pretty cool looking. I didn't realize what I was getting into, but I, anyway, I purchased the thing and I stripped it down, took it, disassembled the whole thing. And okay, I'm going to need this. I'm going to need that. And well, it, it the thing about these vintage sleds, it's it's almost like the the chase and, and finding it in the end is almost like the rewarding part. Yeah. And then comes the business part of it where oh, it's going to cost me how much? Yeah. <laughs> and you trying to negotiate and and so on. I will say this in all honesty, if you like rups or mercs, and you live on the East Coast, you are going to earn anything yeah. you want here because. For some reason, uh, the other side of the Great Lakes seems to be the best place to get this stuff. Wow. And all your Pickens are scarce around here. <laughs> yeah, all our suppliers, the people that have got the parts and repop the parts, that is the area that they come from. Yeah. So. But. I'm just looking at some of your other sleds here while we're talking. But go ahead, continue your thought. Um, well, as you're standing by that Magnum sled, while I'm building these sleds, I was thinking to myself, that's the one sled that I've got to have is a, is a real 76 Magnum. That, that's the holy grail to me. That is the coolest, meanest looking sled that Ruff ever put together. Yeah, that is one hot looking sled. And um, that is a true cleated track, no conversion sled. Uh, that got the same treatment as my other projects. It's got all new panels. I had to repair the hood. The hood was in, in a, as you can see, I kind of... I kind of, I don't know, I did a little bit of a custom paint job on it just because I wanted something a little bit different. And um, it, it's uh, true to its name. It is a squirrely little thing. I got a chance to ride it just either my back of my house here or out on the lake. They, <laughs> they're pretty light. They're pretty light in the front end when you <laughs> fill them up. Um, it's amazing to me that they made this sled, but it's, an option was the speedometer. You notice that that one didn't have a speedo. You oh, could, yeah. You could put that on. Uh, the tack and the temperature were stopped. Being a racing sled, that has got a, you notice that has got a kill switch just like the sled out front. That other Magnum that I got. The tether, the tether yeah. Yeah, the tether. The handlebars are more like a racing configuration. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's funny, this sled here, when i just just looking at the thing, it's, to me, it's just eye candy. Yeah, it's sexy. It is one of the sexier sleds on the snow. Yeah. The, between the stance and the lines, and it just, yeah. You know, if you're a, if you're a guy that loves Rupp snowmobiles, the one thing about Rupp, they stayed to their colors. They knew that True. red looked hot. Yeah. And whether they added black or what, not, but the, uh, they absolutely stayed to the red, and and there's a reason for that because it, it's a they pop. Yeah, they pop. And you're right; it's good contrast off the snow too when you're in their sure. proper environment. Sure. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, cool. Yeah, what do you think of that? He's got them looking great. They're great looking does. machines. I'm surprised yeah. he's missing two things out of the collection. Go ahead. Arctic Cat mini bikes are popular. Oh, they're rare to find. Oh yeah. The Rupps, I mean, the Rupps. Maybe. The Rupp bikes, yeah. And then Rupp had a, a three-wheeler thing that was really cool that's hard yeah. to find, too. They did, and they had a four-wheeler, too, almost like a little dune buggy. In fact, I saw one today. Just, uh, I like um, magazines from the 70s. I was looking at an old Mechanics Illustrated from, I think, 1972, and they had an ad in there. I'll, I'll maybe take an image of it and put it on here next week. But it was like a little four-wheel, almost like a mini dune buggy. Yeah. Yeah, it's really wild what they were doing. Very innovative. I'm surprised some of the companies didn't stick it out. Like, Rupp was coming, they were coming along, getting popular, and then all of a sudden they just quit. Um, 
Yeah. Mer- Mercury soaked a pile of money into race teams and got real popular. And then they just pulled the plug. Yeah. And a lot of those, like you said, especially with um, Mercury or Evan Rude or John Deere, they had the financial ability if they wanted to stay in the game that they could have because yes. they were part of a much larger corporation. Yep. You know, but somebody in there behind a desk, I'm sure, just decided, well, this, the numbers aren't working. Let's pull the plug. Yeah. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Ray Parento, who we we're just talking to, who's got these rups, uh, this is one of his latest rups that I have not seen in person yet. And I want to remedy that. I, I've made making uh, plans with him to go up there and uh, do some video on that sled. I can't wait to hear the story on that as to how that came to be and if he did a restoration on it. Or, and he does most of the work himself on those sleds. Nice work. Yeah, really impressive what he does with those. And we've got some comments coming in, and we've got a couple more things to do here. Here we go. John Springer Jr., regular viewer. He says, awesome. Rups, very nice. And then uh, David from Alaska Railroad says, totally agree on what he said about the 76 Magnum. It's an amazing machine. And I would have to agree, too, as far as the entire Rup lineup over the years. That, that's probably the sexiest one. Would you agree with that? Oh, that's a great-looking snowmobile. Yeah, that is hot. That is hot. Now, I've got a good friend of mine, Jeff Gibbs. Um, he, he loves the podcast and we're good friends and we talk snowmobiling whenever we get together. Now he's got a, a snowmobile trailer for sale. He sent me some images and I promised him that I would put together a little montage with some music under it to help him try to sell his sled. So if you like what you see here and if you're in New Hampshire or Vermont, uh, give him a call. He'll, his number will be on here. Let's take a look. So that's the snowmobile trailer of Jeff Gibbs. That is for sale, and it's in the Hanover, Hanover, New Hampshire area. So if you're curious about that, his number is on there. Just give him a jingle. And uh, be, if, if you do give him a jingle, be sure and tell him that you heard about it on the podcast. Good size trailer, the pull. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Any uh, final thoughts before we wind down the podcast? Or Great show. I like those reps on there. I've, yeah. I've heard people talk about there's a guy in the States who's rebuilding the Merck Twisters. Oh, really? A replica. Have you ever heard of that? I have not, but I'm curious. If anybody viewing this knows anything about that, please uh, be in touch with us. We'd love to get in touch with the person and, and maybe do a, a profile on them or bring them on here live. Yeah, I, I heard he's trying to start his own class of, of 340, 440 class, just Twisters. Yeah. He's making a reproduction that way that people doesn't have to take their old collector ones out and race them. Yeah, because those are very popular for racing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and they do well racing too. Too well. <laughs> <laughs> too well, exactly. <laughs> so that's a smart idea to take that and try to reproduce it. And yeah, that's and and I'm sure even uh, how do I say this? He could he could probably make a decent profit on it too because I'm sure you could get not overcharge but you know charge a, a good amount for it enough to cover your costs make a nice profit and still at a price point that's worthwhile for racers to want to do it he could make a lot of money off selling parts when they smash them up <laughs> yeah yeah because they do bang them up on, on yeah. the track for sure yeah that's a great idea if anybody knows anything about that uh please be in touch with uh, in touch with us about that we'd love to bring him on give him some publicity and it's a great way for us to all learn about it and, and see what the story is there uh, now, David from Alaska Railroad says, thanks for the show, Mike and Rob. Great to be back on sleds. Absolutely. It, uh, it is absolutely. Uh, it's fun to be back. I mean, I love the muscle car podcast and everything, but my heart is in this vintage snowmobile stuff. And uh, it's really, it's great. We're just starting a new season. And, I love uh, snowmobiling too. Yeah, for sure. And just so many memories of uh, around, you know, the 70s and all the vintage stuff. And 
it was just a wonderful time. And I was just a kid, but I have wonderful memories of that, as I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of the Muscle Car Podcast, Rob and I are doing that every Wednesday night. Uh, if you're curious about that, there are links in the description where you can watch past episodes of the Muscle Car Podcast. And uh, wherever you find it, uh, visit there every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. And you'll find live episodes. We're on there every Wednesday night going live, 9 p.m. And, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Let me change screens here and uh, get up, queue up our video. Uh, as always, we give uh, the last word to Amsoil. So, yeah, thank you so much, Rob, for coming on. Thank you to all the viewers. We'll see you next week. And great broadcast, Mike. Yes, <laughs> if I live. <coughs> so, anyway, with, with that, I'm going to get out of me coughing here and give the last word to Amsoil. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening. Hello, everyone. This is Rob and Mike. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm doing good. Mike, yourself? Very well. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Now, uh, today, we're going to be talking about AMSOIL. And uh, in a few moments, we're going to show you how you can get the deepest discounts, free shipping, and free gifts when you order your AMSOIL products through us. But first, I'm going to ask Rob to give you a quick description of what AMSOIL is and why you should consider using AMSOIL products in your motorized vehicles. Thanks, Mike. AMSOIL is 100% synthetic oil. Everybody uses Amsoil for a different reason. Some people like the benefits that Amsoil is warranted for 25,000 miles or one year. The reason we can do that is because Amsoil doesn't oxidize. It doesn't form the usual carbons, gums, sludges like petroleum oils do. That's why we can keep it in the engines longer. Petroleum oils never do wear out. They oxidize themselves. That's why they have to be changed at 3,000 kilometers. And Amsoil likes the benefit that you only have to change the oil once a year. That saves some money. Some of the people like the benefit of Amsoil is it's a slipperier type lube. By having a slipperier type lube, it cuts down friction and drag. By less friction and drag, engines run 20 to 50 degrees cooler, better gas mileage. Now, Amsoil says 25% more protection than the industry requires is in the Amsoil bottles. My average customer gets about 10% increase in gas mileage. That's a big savings. Yeah. And by cutting down friction and drag, for every 10 degrees you cut down the friction and drag, doubles the life of the engine. So by having the engine run cooler, it makes it last longer. Some people like the benefit of the range of the Amsoil. Amsoil's flash point is 425 degrees, and it pours at 50 below zero. Wow. If you ever try petroleum oil when it's 10 below, it turns to the honey. And yeah. in the summertime, petroleum oil thins out, and once, once it thins out, that's when it starts breaking down. So Amsoil's an all-season oil, can give you better gas mileage, longer engine life, less maintenance. It ends up being cheaper over a year's time running Amsoil than it is petroleum oils. That's amazing. That's amazing. And Amsoil is, is available for pretty much any motorized vehicle, uh, anything, from, anything from lawn equipment, cars, trucks, boats, ATVs, motorcycles, snowmobiles. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people phone me up and say, well, what's the benefit of our gear loop? Exactly what I told you about the engine oil. It pours in cold weather. It runs cooler, makes the equipment last longer. And they say, well, it's the benefit of the small engine. Same thing. Makes the engine run cooler, last longer, better performance. So it saves on all the applications that Amsoil has available. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah, let's uh, let's talk now. Uh, hopefully, this has convinced people uh, to think about maybe joining us in the Amsoil experience. Let's talk about some of the discounts and free shipping and how that all happens. I'm going to pop a, a graphic on the screen, and uh, yeah, by all means, if you want to talk talk people through how this preferred customer program works, Amsoil has a number of different programs. One of our main ones is a catalog customer, where somebody can order directly out of our catalog. If they order out of the catalog, they order hundred dollars worth. Amsoil will ship it right to their house. But our best program is our preferred customer. For only $10 for six months, you become a preferred customer, you save 25% on all the product. You order $100 worth, they're going to give you free shipping. Um, you don't have to order a whole case. You can mix and match. Say you want four bottles of small engines, seven bottles of 5W30, and a couple of gear loops. You can mix and match. You can order one bottle at a time if you want. There's no minimums, no maximums. By being a preferred customer, you save over 25% on all the products you're going to buy. Amsoil sends you extra gifts, uh, a $5 gift certificate on your birthday, $5 when you renew, renew your account, and stuff like that. So it's a good way to save on some of the products you want to buy. For sure, for sure. Yeah, it's an incredible value. And this is the, the deepest level of discount that anyone can get when ordering Amsoil. Is that correct? It is. It is. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's take people through the step-by-step the -step experience of, of placing an Amsoil order. Then that would include signing up for the preferred customer discount, or sorry, preferred customer program so they can receive those deepest levels of discount. So let's go to the website. This is what the website is going to look at look like. These are some screenshots. If you Once you go to Amsoil.com, there's a link in the description, or you can just type that into a browser, Amsoil.com. This is the page you land on at the upper 
corner of the page there, you see how I've circled in red. That is the link to click, the Join Now link. That will take you to the preferred customer program page where you can take advantage of all these discounts and free shipping and everything that we've just been talking about. This is what that page looks like. In the lower right, you're going to click Join Now. This will pop up. You select the duration you'd like, whether it's six months or 12 months, and click Add to Cart. Now, once this, this uh, pop-up goes away, you'll be back on the main page. And the upper left, you'll see where I've got that red arrow. It says Shop. Now you can start shopping for products, and on your very first order, you're going to get these discounts and the free shipping as long as it's over $100. You'll get all of these benefits right away. So once you click Shop, it's going to take you to uh, some product the product page. There's different types of oils, lubricants, so on and so forth. For the benefit of this exercise we're doing now, I'm just going to click Motor Oil. It shows different types of motor oil. Let's click Gasoline. Now this takes us to an item. It's uh, their synthetic motor oil. And you can see the item there, and there's choices for different viscosities. But take a look at the price. Let's take a closer look. Let's zoom in. Uh, but if you've joined the preferred customer program first, you're going to automatically get the deepest levels of discount. That's what we're looking at here. You're saving $3.80 on that quart of oil. Instead of paying $16.29, you're now paying, paying $12.49 for that quart of oil. That is the deepest level of discount you can possibly get. And then uh, you just add the, the, the quantity that you'd like. You select any other items that you're thinking about, add them to the cart. And once you uh, click Add to Cart for the final time, you're going to see this come up at the top of the screen. It's going to show your items and your, your um, the total that you're at so far. <coughs> Pardon me. And then uh, you just click View Cart in the upper right, and that'll take you to your cart. Uh, take a close look here at the upper right. That blue box shows that you're getting free shipping. You're eligible for free shipping on this order because it's over $100. That little yellow box shows that you've got the preferred customer membership on your order that gives you the deepest levels of discounts for the next 6 to 12 months. And then below that, you've got the, the items that have been selected. I just, for the exercise here, I selected nine quarts of this signature series. But that brings us up over $100 for the free shipping. We're saving $34.20. And if you're ready to, to finish, you click Check Out Now, and that takes you uh, to this screen here. If you haven't signed up with an Amazon account at this point, just click in the lower right to create an account, create a new account. It's going to ask you for some basic information, a name and those types of things. Now, let's take a closer look. You'll see this gray shaded box. This is a very important box. This is going to ask you if someone has referred you to Amsoil. And if so, please enter my name. My name is Mike Lapierre. It's spelled right there on the screen for the correct spelling. And also the referral number, 304-555-94. That's how um, you make sure that Rob and I get credit for this. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have signed up for Amsoil under Rob. So when you order using this referral number, Rob and I both benefit. So if you enjoy these podcasts that we're doing, this is a wonderful way to support the podcast because when you order uh, using this referral number, Rob and I both benefit. And the commissions I make go directly toward offsetting the cost of doing this pod these podcasts. So I thank you in advance for that, for using my referral number. I very much appreciate it. Uh, and once you've done that, you just go into the next screen to enter your payment information and you're done. Now, once you've entered, once you've placed your order that's over $100, uh, and that, that order includes your Amsoil Preferred Customer Program, you are now eligible to get a free DVD from myself. Now, this is going to be either a muscle car DVD or a vintage snowmobile DVD. Uh, use the email address on the screen, wkspodcasts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Let me know which email. I'm sorry. Let me know which DVD you would like me to send you, the muscle car or the uh, uh, vintage snowmobile DVD, and I'll get that right out to you. As you're typing in that, that email in the subject line, be sure and type in capital letters, free DVD requests, so it stands out as I'm checking my email, and we'll get that right out to you. So I guess the last thing, Rob, that we wanted to talk about is... Uh, if someone is considering Amsoil as a business opportunity. Um, yeah, yes. If anybody has a retail or a commercial account and they would like to buy directly from Amsoil, just send Mike a line. He'll show you how to set up and you can buy directly from Amsoil. But if you are interested in starting your own part-time business, a part-time business that can grow into a full-time income, Mike and I will show you the Amsoil marketing plan. Amsoil has a large selection of products that cover almost every application. So it doesn't matter if you're into snowmobile, boating, or ATV, or, or hot rods. We have an oil for every application. It's a fun type business that I really enjoy doing. Where else can I go and have fun and make money doing it? And Mike and I are here to help you all the way along if you need any help on how to promote or, or to find new accounts. We're here to help you. For sure, for sure. So when you sign up under that uh, that number, this 304-555-94, you're getting Rob and I as a team. Now, Rob has been doing Amsoil for 40 years. Can you believe that? 40 years. So he knows every aspect of this business, and he knows all of the ins and outs of the products. So he'll be able to help you with any kind of product questions or any kind of questions to show you the different business models that you can do with Amsoil. And then the other thing that you get when you sign up under me is I've got a strong background in social media. 
So if you need some coaching on how to generate MZOIL leads using Facebook and YouTube, I'm happy to coach you with that when you sign up under Rob and I. Uh, you get both of us as a team uh, to help you, to coach you, to support you, whatever you need to get you, get you off and running with this business and having fun with it. it like Rob said, it's enorm an enormous amount of fun. If you're like Rob and I and you enjoy going to any kind of you know boat shows, car shows, motorcycle shows, snowmobile shows, anything with a motor, you like going to those shows, those events, those races, this is a great way to turn that into a, 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 a income opportunity for you. Yes, yes. And just by wearing my AMSO hat at one of these events, people come up and ask me about AMSO. People don't, people don't know where to buy it, and I'm there to help them, show them where they can buy the product. Perfect, perfect. Well, cool, cool. Well, this is great. Uh, any final thoughts, Rob, before we wrap it up? AMSO's a fun business. AMSO's been around since 1968. You know, it was the first synthetic oil to be AI approved. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's very early in the game, too, isn't it? Yes. For sure. Well, good. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for viewing. Hopefully, we've gotten you excited, as excited as we are about the Amsoil products. We'd love it if you could enjoy, if you could join us either uh, as someone who uses the Amsoil products or to join the Amsoil team uh, as a business opportunity. And we thank you so much for viewing. Have okay. a great day. You have a good day.